Greetings, fellow Classic TV fans, and welcome to Retro TV Trivia. I'm your host, Pat McCormack, from the Golden Rage of TV. On today's podcast, I'm speaking with the legendary Stanley Livingston, a.k.a. Chip Douglas, from My Three Sons. As you'll hear, Stanley, like his brother and former podcast guest Barry, is full of fascinating stories about his days on both the big and small screens. You'll also enjoy hearing about his vast knowledge of the inner workings of the Hollywood acting and film industry. If you or someone you know is an aspiring actor, you will definitely want to hear what Mr. Livingston has to say and the guidance his program, The Actor's Journey, has to offer. We'll also talk about some of his incredible artwork that is for sale. So, enjoy! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podcast, the legendary Stanley Livingston. Stanley! Pat, I'm here. How are you? You are here, and thank you so much. It was so great running into you a few weeks back at the Hollywood show. Um, that was a interesting event. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, I haven't done one of those in about five, six years. That's like my first one in L.A. in a long time. Uh, I used to do maybe one a year uh, up to about 2014, 15. And anyway, just because of covid and you know everything else going on or i get busy on things and just couldn't make it but uh, yeah it was fun i always like going to uh, those events because they're more than just a, an autograph show where you know people come up to you but for me it's almost like going to a high school reunion where you're running into a bunch of your old friends and peers and people you worked with or for or whatever you know over right. the years right oh uh, yeah a lot of fun our friend john provost was there jerry mathers mm-hmm. um a few other of the classic greats but of course when i saw you there i was like okay this is serendipitous in that <laughs> <laughs> i've always wanted to talk to you but yeah well that's the other good thing is you meet a lot of people uh you know new friends new uh, people that you you know, hit it off with, uh, sometimes in radio, sometimes doing TV shows, sometimes they're proprietors of other autograph shows. So, yeah, it's a, you know, you never know what it's going to be. It's kind of oh. like show business. Uh, every time you turn the corner, there's something new. Right, right. As long as the intentions are good. And I mean, with me, the intentions are to honor you guys for what you gave us and what you're still doing. And my wife and I were both taken with just how gracious you were um, to speak with us. It was, uh, it was like, all right, he's as down to earth as his brother is. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's just showbiz. It's not really anything special. But, uh, you know, people on the other side of the tube you know, sometimes hold us to high esteem, uh, sometimes higher than we deserve. So Now, I do have a bit of a confession. All right. When I interviewed your brother, Barry, a few weeks back, and this was prior to me meeting up with you at the Hollywood show, Uh and he was great, just fantastic interview, I said to him, I says, (laughs) you know, out of the brothers, you are my favorite. And he said, (laughs) I bet you say that to all the brothers when you have them on the show. (laughs) Sounds like my brother. (laughs) And I thought, you know... He actually foresaw that this was going to happen <laughs> because here's the fact, and I'm not I'm not blowing smoke here. Chip was my favorite on the show. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Barry. It's just true. The thing was, I was the youngest of three brothers. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally get it because you know the show really uh, you know had a wide swath of age groups represented there. You know, all the way in the beginning for me, who was nine years old. Uh, Robbie, who was probably about 16, 17 when the show started. Tim Constantine was about 19, 20. Fred, who was supposed to be in his late 40s. Uh, And then you had Bub, who was, you know, uh, probably 70 or late 60s or something. So everybody found a favorite, you know, one that they could relate to. And I think a lot of it just had to do by age. You know, if you were a teenager, you related to Robbie. If you're still a kid, you related to me. And, you know, kids that were younger than me still related to me because I was probably the closest to their their age. So, uh, yeah, you know, that was the one good thing about the show. There was something there for everybody. That's brilliant, too, when you think about it. It's like mass appeal. Let's just go for mass appeal. Was it on purpose? 
Well, you know, I think shows were always that way. I mean, the shows of the late 50s, early 60s were all, a lot of them were based around family. Sure. So, you know, you always had that, you know, nuclear family with a, a mom, a dad, uh, and then, you know, usually three kids. You know, usually there would be a sister mixed in there, either as <laughs> the youngest or the, the middle uh, or maybe even the oldest one. That's kind of how they were constructed. Uh, the thing that was unique about My Three Sons and I think, you know, gave it the simpatico factor was there was no woman present. Uh, it was all male household bumbling, trying to survive without a woman in the house and doing the best we could. And, you know, the women all felt sorry <laughs> for us one to mother us and become the mother or, or the girlfriend of Fred McMurray. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of a clever thing. And, it was really ahead of its time because, you know, usually you didn't see that kind of household represented on TV. It, it was always inclusive of the mom, the dad, and the kids. So this, right. this was unusual. Sure. Um, and, you know, the idea, I think, for My Three Sons is original as that was for TV. I, I, my feeling is it came from a movie that was out about a year or two earlier called The Shaggy Dog. Right. And uh, which also coincidentally happened to star Fred McMurray. There were three boys, uh, you know, Tommy Kirk and Tim Considine, who also came to My Three Sons. And then there was the little boy who was my age, Kevin Corcoran, uh, who always played Moochie or something, whatever his character was. Um, and then they even had a dog. The only thing missing was the uh, grandfather. So, you know, you throw that into the mix uh, and then you got My Three Sons. Yeah. So I think a producer saw that and thought, gee, what a great idea for a TV series. Well, it, it's a little more complicated than that because the actual producer, producer who, you know, uh, pushed that idea. Uh, the original idea was my three daughters. Really? Uh, that That's what they went to the network with was they were trying to get the McGuire sisters uh, who were part of the Lawrence Welk organization. Huh. Uh, and, um, you know, they were performers on that show and they sang and probably the show would have had much more music in it. And the dad on the show was to be Eddie Albert. And for some reason, the McGuire sisters decided they didn't want to do it and wanted to stay, uh, uh, you know, on the show they were with, which was Lawrence Well, and uh, not leave. So they had to reboot the idea. And I'm assuming he probably saw the shaggy dog and goes, that's it. I'm going to see if I can get Fred McMurray to be in it, which was kind of a bold move at that time, too, because Fred McMurray was in 1958, 59, was probably the biggest movie star in Hollywood, the highest paid actor in Hollywood at that time. And the idea of somebody of his stature doing a TV show was almost nil. Not to say that guys like that didn't appear on TV shows. You know, they would do specials or they were. Fred was friends with Lucy and Desi and would occasionally do one of their TV shows or a TV movie they did. But, you know, to do the daily grind of a TV series was unheard of. You know, it's usually actors who are kind of further along in their career and the opportunities and the actual motion picture industry were kind of drying up and, you know, to survive and keep working. They took TV series, but Fred was at the pinnacle of his career when this happened. He had just come off the Kane Mutiny uh, in 1958. Uh, he did The Apartment in 1959. Um, he did uh, The Absent-Minded Professor for Disney. Uh, and uh, later, I think about a year later, did The Son of Flubber and, and, the, and The Shaggy Dog. So that was all within a you know, five-year period, uh, kind of wrapped around the beginning of My Three Sons. But he had personal reasons for wanting to do the show. He didn't want to go off and do a movie because, you you know, a lot of times away from home, two, three months at a pop, he and his wife had just adopted twins and they were growing up and he didn't want to go out of town and miss them growing up. So he thought, you know, gee, if I did a TV series, I could go to work at eight o'clock in the morning and be home by five or six. And I'd be just like a regular working stiff, and but I would still be in the entertainment industry. And, you know, I'm sure he knew if he lent his stature and credibility to whatever series, it was going to be a big hit just because of who he was. And that was the case. You know, uh, Don Federson approached him. He was open to the idea. He ended up becoming Don Federson's 50-50 partner in the ownership of the show. And he was paid a huge salary to be on it. 
Uh, he got to go home at five o'clock every day and he had the entire summer off. He was off. He'd shoot for two months, go away for three months and come back at the end for another two, three months to finish off what, whatever's left out of the 39 episodes we shot in the earlier seasons. Right. And, and with all that, you hear this and go, well, isn't he just the most privileged, you know, uh, um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, um, uppity <laughs> actor in the business when in fact he was, he was just the opposite, the, he was just yeah. the opposite wasn't he yeah yeah for being a movie star of his stature you know you could have had anything you wanted done anything you wanted you know it was just yours for the picking and uh you know fred didn't have to cater to anybody everybody catered to him but he was just uh you know i when i look back on him I'm going, this is just like some ordinary guy from the midwest who just <laughs> Happened to become a, a movie star, but somehow retained all his Midwestern sensibilities. I mean, they lived in a in a nice area of town, was in Brentwood, in a very nice house. But you know, by far, it wasn't like living in Bel Air or Beverly Hills type mansion. Uh, when we were doing My Three Sons, yeah, Fred could have been driving a Mercedes or a Ferrari or you know whatever. <laughs> Movie stars drove at the time, <laughs> driving a, a Chevrolet station wagon. Of course, and uh, yeah, <laughs> so that was just him, you know. And it, it, you know, really made an impression on me as I grew older and became an adult. Going, you know, I don't, I'm not buying into any of this movie star crap at all. You know, I just want to live my life and just be an ordinary guy. I don't need these things to stand out or, uh, you know fill my ego up with who I am. And, and, you know, yeah, yeah. So he sort of became like a, a personal hero to me that he could remain, you know, who he was in spite of, you know, how he was perceived, you know, by, especially by the industry and fans and all that. Right. Uh, so that, that made a, a huge impression on me and I, I appreciated it and I've tried to model my life as best I could. Uh, you know, of course, I didn't have the success Fred did, but, you know, uh, for whatever success my three sons brought me, you know, I probably owe that to him, too. Uh, had he not been in that show and, you know, they got, I don't know, some other actor who was popular at the time, but not of the set of Fred McMurray, you know, and it probably had a, a pretty good run, you know, maybe four or five years and that would have been it. But because it was Fred McMurray. The show just went on and on and on and on. You know, we ended up doing 12 seasons. And right. even when we were canceled, we weren't really even canceled. We were sort of euthanized because of a uh, edict that had come down from the federal, um, uh, what do they call it, communications. Right. The FCC mm -hmm. decided that networks who owned TV shows could no longer produce them. They had to be produced by independent producers and sold to the network. So it was kind of an antitrust thing. They didn't want them making them and distributing them. That happened in the movie industry too, but they got around the TV about 1972 and said, right. okay, here's, here's the deal. You have to divest me, you meaning CBS or ABC or NBC of any shows that you own and fill them in with, you know, material that you bought from independent producers, just to be right. fair. So well, they were allowed to keep one show, and uh, for whatever reason, they decided to keep Gunsmoke. And uh, and I think by that point, you know, Fred was probably getting a little tired of doing it. So, yeah, we were just kind of quietly euthanized with the super high ratings. I mean, we were, you know, in the, at times in the top 10, certainly in the, you know, in the top, up to the top 20, maybe even to 30, but you're, you know, we're near danger of being canceled unless you're about, you know, 40, 50 or above that. So the show could have gone on and on and on. I don't know where it would have gone. I guess they could have married off Ernie or married off Tramp or something, and, <laughs> you know, but yeah, the, the show would have needed a dynamic change at that point. And then the question is, would it have been My Three Sons after you made that change? It would have been a you know completely different show with the same name. So right. it was probably the right thing to happen. Well, and, and in fact, you guys got a ball rolling with this. I mean, a boulder rolling. You know, it's, correct, correct me if I'm wrong here, 62nd anniversary of the show is this year? Uh, well, our 63rd anniversary. We just had the 62nd on uh, September 19th, 2022. Yeah, that literally went on the air and, and between prime time for 12 years and immediately went into syndication in 73 when 
it went off of prime time. So from 73 to 85, it was on daytime TV every day, sometimes multiple times a day. In 1985, Nick at Night came along, started running it. And 10 years later, 95, uh, TV Land came along, ran it for 10 years. And after that, it was kind of, it's been all over the place. You know, we're on the Hallmark Channel. We've been on the Lifetime Channel, the Odyssey Channel. Uh, right now it's on the me TV. It's been on there, I think about 10 years. And, uh, yeah. So we, you know, literally have never gone off the air. It's yeah. not only started 62 years ago, but in one shape, form or another, uh, it's been on TV every day since 1960. See, and I rest my case. Does that mean it was done perfectly? Just to, to think about it. It ended perfectly. It shouldn't have gone any longer, you know? It- did, but, you know, there's other shows that were, in my estimation, kind of perfect, too, but they didn't have Rick McMurray. But uh, I think ours just resonated in a special time and place with audiences. TV was still new in the late 50s, early 60s, and the idea that the show came along that really kind of cut a huge swath with the audience in terms of it representing, uh, you know, a time and place uh, that you know, resonated with the audience. It looked just like their household. In other words, you know, you watch some of the other shows out of that era, and they're a little bit kitschy. You know, if you watch Leave It to Beaver, I mean, you know, what mom vacuums wearing a party dress and pearl? You know, <laughs> my, three sons, my three sons, right, was never that. Our house was a mess the whole time. <laughs> Newspapers on the floor, dog hair on the couch, <laughs> homework books everywhere, uh, pots boiling over, People trying to vacuum over bodies that are on the floor doing their homework. You know, and so it felt like, a, you know, it felt like just like the house you lived in. It, it, it was very realistic for a time. And I think that kind of resonated, too. So and then, you know, moving forward, looking back at it, I, I think. It's charm, especially to audiences that have, you know, are like 40 plus, say, looking at it, or even, you know, the age group of 50, 60, looking back, that it's, you know, it, there's a nostalgia thing there. And you look at it, and yeah, you remember the show, and you enjoyed the show, but I think it's how we watched those shows that really made a difference, because there's this added layer of unlike now where everybody watches everything in their own room, you know, on their own iPhone, uh, in 1959, 50s, 60s, there was usually one TV in the house. It was in the living room and you watched the shows that you liked or your parents liked probably, but you did it all together, you know, and it was probably a calming feeling and probably the one time in your life where everybody got together in a room and did something and all all agreed that they liked that show and watched it together. <laughs> so I think that implanted something in people's brains and watching the show brings them back to that time and place. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And I, I blame Frank Duvall too. I mean, as soon as yeah. you heard that theme, <laughs> you knew what was on. <laughs> Right, right. No, it was a great, great theme song. However, Frank DeVall created, uh, was it the Beverly Hillbilly song, too, or something the, like I that? I think it was the Brady Bunch and Family Affair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did all those, but he's also the guy that did the music for uh, Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. <laughs> yep. Yeah, very so, talented. But again, that was yeah. the, those were the days, you know, when mm-hmm. everybody would be different areas of the home, and then all of a sudden, you'd hear, and it's like, run to the TV, because it's, yeah, my, yeah. <laughs> it's my three right, sons. Right. Yeah, for me, or my my little age group, when I was growing up, seven, eight years old, you know, we'd be outside playing after school, and then all of a sudden, the street light would come on, we'd see it come oh, on yeah. about five o'clock, and we knew it was time to go in and watch the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> That's how we knew, and, you know, we'd all make a beeline for the TV set at either my house or, you know, my friend's house. We'd all sit around the TV watching Mickey Mouse and Spin and Marty and the Hardy Boys uh, or Popeye cartoons. You know, that was the other one that was on then. So, yeah, you know, it's what we grew up with. We're kind of a pulp pop culture phenomenon, I guess. And, right. You know, who knew it was going to last that long and become inculcated into the minds of uh, senior citizens? Yeah. But, but the good part is it's still on. You can get a dose of nostalgia every day and make yourself feel good. Yes. It's the whole reason I do what I do. It's yeah. that feeling. It's that nothing gives you that. 
anymore. And, you know, on, on top of it being, I mean, virtual American history, <laughs> this is what we're looking at. This happened here, and it was a big deal. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and not, I was going to say— It was a place it, to get your thrills and chills, but if you want, you know, family and— Family, good feelings, the warmth of family, the, you know, that's that definitely what that show pervade. Right, right. And I love the old sci-fi stuff. So I was going to say Rod Serling and the Outer Limits definitely gave you yeah. some thrills and chills. <laughs> gave us thrills and chills, yeah. My brother and I used to watch that and other things we weren't supposed to watch, I guess, alone. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so by then... <laughs> You were already a movie star. I'm sorry. I, I have to say it, Stanley. You, you had been in some major productions. And did you ever feel like, you know, maybe I should have just, just stuck in the movies? I mean, again, I... Yeah, but there was a, you know, like at every point in somebody's life, you come up to a crossroad where you got to pick one road or the other to go. And, and my life uh, at one point kind of came to something like that. Yeah, it, it, you're right. I started in the industry probably about four years before my three sons came along. And, uh, in the beginning, you know, I, I, I wasn't an actor. I was trying to be an actor, but that was the trajectory. But, uh, you know, you're basically hired in the beginning as an extra, meaning you're just, Somebody doesn't have any lines or usually with a group of other extras in the scene. And, uh, you know, I did that for a while. And, uh, you know, so I at least got to be on a movie set and saw what was going on. Yeah. And uh, lucked out, started getting, uh, you know, sent out on more and more things. And finally went out on a, a TV show called The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, which in 1957, beginning in 1957, that was like the number one show. Right. You know, with the, again, a family show that everybody loved. Uh, been on the air probably about four, four or five years by then, and had two kids on it: Dave, uh, David Nelson, or Ricky Nelson, who literally grew up before America's eyes. Right. And uh, they wanted to introduce little kids in there. You know, somehow that has always been the formula: the kind of perpetuating a show and breathing new life into it is bringing in young kids. And so uh, Ozzy decided to have a group of neighborhood kids that somehow he associated with, and they're always at his house. I mean, it was, you know, in, in today's, looking at it today's eyes, I go, well, that's kind of weird. Why would he want all these little kids hanging around? Most of them were uh, like little boys, too, not little girls. So, yeah. uh, a little bit questionable, you know, to today's eyes. But back then, it was totally innocent but you know we'd be at the nelson's house and eat dinner and they were babysitting us you know if he had a show where there was a horse kids loved horses so you know he'd bring us in there was a show with, somehow he got involved in like a western or something and so all the kids had cowboy outfits on so you know that that was going on anyway in the course of shooting one of those like i said i was just one of the kids hired to be an extra he came up to me and said hey could you say this line and so he told me what to say, and I went, yeah, yeah, I could do that. So he said, okay, when you get right to here, I'm putting a piece of tape on the floor, but don't look down at it. But right when you get there, just be looking at me and look me right in the eyes and say that line, and then to turn to your right and go. And so we shot it a couple times, and I did that. And then he moved the camera closer, and we did it again a couple times. And I didn't know he was getting my close-up, but that's what <laughs> that was all about. And at the end of the day, I went up to my mom and he said, could you please leave your contact information uh, with my secretary in the front office? I want to have Stanley back again. And, of course, my mom was ecstatic. Uh, I didn't quite realize what was going on. But, uh, yeah, about a couple months later, I got a, my agent got a call and they wanted me to come back. And I did another show and then another show. <laughs> so from about 1957 through the end of 1959, I had done a dozen, 15 episodes of Ozzy and Harriet. Because of that, I started getting movies. I got a movie called Rally Around the Flag Boys with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Right. I got another, another film called The Bonnie Parker Story with Dorothy Provine. I got um, Please Don't Eat the Daisies with Doris Day, David Nimitz, and started, you know, making guest appearances on different shows that were on at, at that time. I, you know, I can't even remember what they were, really. You know, I just went and did what I was told, you know, as a right. kid, so I didn't really pay too much attention. No one I really kind of remember, I did a George Goble show. He had a TV show on then, and I remember I played a chess master, and 
beat him at a game of chess. <laughs> I was about <laughs> not eight, nine years old, had glasses on, looked like a little genius. Wow. And uh, anyway, because of being the proximity on this studio, movie studio in Hollywood called General Service, which is where they shot Ozzy and Harriet. Uh, they shot a lot of different TV series there. You know, when I wasn't working, yeah, I took the kids. So I was bored and I'd wander around. And I noticed on the soundstage next to uh, Ozzy and Harriet, there was a show where they had a horse. So I remember I went over and then, when they were through using him, they would walk him out the back door of the sound stage, and he had like a little stable set up back there for him. And you know, go back and talk to the animal handler, and he said, "Hey, do you want to brush him?" And he showed me how to brush him, and I got to feed him carrots, and it was kind of cool. And then on the the other sound stage across from us, one day I noticed they had a dog, and I, I just loved dogs because I didn't have one, you know, when I was a kid. And followed the dog back in and started talking to the the trainer there and he was a really cool guy in fact he ultimately this kind of a coincidence he was the guy that owned tramp on my three sons so ultimately oh. uh at that point I, you know that was yet to be but he had a dog on this tv show it was a basset hound uh, called the people's choice sure was that a, was that a weather wax dog or yeah uh, no no that was no. frank in oh okay. frank in who had benji Oh. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of movie animals. The other Weatherwax. <laughs> yeah, the Weatherwax had Lassie. Yeah, right. That was kind of his big claim to fame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, one day when I was there playing with the dog, uh, this older guy, I mean, to me, almost everybody was old then because mm-hmm. I was only seven years old, came up and was in a suit. and uh, He was probably 30-ish, you know, but I didn't know that. He just seemed old to me. <laughs> And started talking to me, wanted to know who I was and why I was there. And, you know, finally came down to where my mom was. <laughs> and I remember I said to him, uh, am I in trouble, mister? And he's like, no, no, you're not in trouble, but I would like to meet your mom. And I was like, oh, God, I'm, I am in trouble. So <laughs> I had to take him across the street to stage five and walked up to my mom. I said, Mom, this guy uh, wants to meet you. And so I kind of, you know, just get out of law, but kept them in eyesight. And my mom and this guy were talking, standing there talking for about 15 minutes. I didn't know what it was about, and my mom never said anything. But anyway, lo and behold, the guy was Jackie Cooper. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, so I didn't know who he was. I know, but he went up to my mom. And anyway, what happened three months later was he wrote a TV pilot for me, and uh, which he was going to produce and direct called Skippy. Right. And Skippy was a movie that he was in when he was a kid. I Probably some of your audience will know he was one of the original Little Rascals. Sure. Uh, but he was also a huge child star oh, yeah. in the 30s. Uh, and he did a movie called Skippy, which actually won the Academy Award that year. And the director, I believe, won the Academy Award. And Jackie was nominated, uh, not in a supporting role, but in the best actor role as, as uh you know, it's a child actor, the youngest person ever to be nominated in a leading role. And to this day, that record still holds. Yeah. So uh, anyway, he created this TV pilot in December of 1958. We shot it. And, uh, you know, we were hoping for the best. And anyway, it just ended up not selling. And then he ended up uh, going on to produce and direct another TV series, which he started and called Hennessy. So anyway, I was under contract to him, but the reel became useful in my career. In fact, that was the reel that was shown to the people that were about to cast, uh, please don't eat the daisies. And of course, based on the reel, I got hired. And uh, anyway, a little bit later, my agent called and said, there's a series that's going to be produced. They're looking for some kids for it. Uh, Can you get that reel? (laughs) I need to show it to some producers. So how that was done in those days is my parents would have to run a theater after midnight because wow. that's when they finished showing their, you know, daily, you know, shows that they show. You'd have to hire the projectionist to stay afterwards and project, you know, whatever you were projecting, which in this case was Skippy. And then these uh, producers or their representatives, casting agents would come and, and watch it. And uh, anyway, uh, I ended up getting an offer to do My Three Sons. Well, bringing it back 
to what we were originally talking. And this is kind of a circumlocutious way of getting like back it. to that point. You were asking me about you know what I have preferred the movie industry and the crossroads in the road. I had gone out. Well, actually, didn't go out, but these people saw that same reel and wanted me to do a movie then that was being done uh, about Huckleberry Finn. Oh, yes. And, yeah, it was around for a while. And originally it was going to be a musical. Then they decided not to make it a musical. I think it had Tony Randall in it. And uh, they were looking for Huckleberry Finn. And if I remember right, uh, I was the contender that they wanted. And right simultaneously while this happened, my agent, the lady who discovered me and was nurturing my career, was killed in an automobile accident. Mm. And uh, so my parents had to find somebody to help at that time and and potentially be a new agent for me. So uh, we found this lady was a big children's agent. then. Her name was Jeannie Halliburton. And uh, anyway, we had to make a choice because, you know, they had made an offer for me to, to play Chip. And the movie, uh, I think it was MGM, wanted me to do uh, this Huckleberry Finn movie. And uh, I couldn't do both because they were both starting at the same time. So we kind of left it up to the agent what to do. Of course, you know, my because I was a kid and loved Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. I'm like, I want to do that. And anyway, the agent decided it would be better to do the TV series. Right. And uh, sounds like you needed one more Livingston. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, something like that. Well, Barry was already working around that time, but he was yeah much younger and kind yeah. of a different different type. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I had to pass up that. And I you know always wondered what trajectory my life would have gone. You know, had I got to do that movie, would I've been able to do more movies, and then how long would that have lasted? If if at all, you might do one movie and then never work again. And. Uh, or, you know, and I think the agent, uh, probably a little bit of self-interest there. It's like, gee, if I let him do the movie, he's going to get a nice paycheck. And then that's that. And <laughs> he'll never work again. If I let him do the TV series, that's a whole year's worth of work. Right. And I'll get paid thir- 39 times, mm-hmm. you know, per episode. And, and, oh, yeah, and it might go on for a year or two. So, that you know, that's how the decision probably got made. Yeah. But it turned out to be the right decision. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I have no regrets. Although I, I would have really loved to be either Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn. Uh-huh. Uh, well, yeah. Let's yeah, face it, so. your legacy is is immense and intact, sir. As is your brother's, and uh, I mean, it's yeah. just a lot of talent. Yeah, we've been you know fortunate, and lucky with the people that we ran across who you know kind of helped make decisions. And, uh, yeah, you know, it just uh, kind of went on. You know, started doing My Three Sons, but in between seasons, movies came my way. I got a movie called X-15 with Charlie Bronson, uh, Mary Tyler Moore. And it was actually the first feature film that uh, this, who at this point, he was just a TV director. Uh, a guy named Richard Donner was going to direct. Oh, yeah. And Richard and I became pretty good friends, you know, Closer friends as uh, an 11 year old and a 30 year old can be. But yeah, we'd see each other and, you know, uh, being in show business, you learn skills, even though you're a kid, they're adult skills, how to walk into a room and go up to adults and introduce yourself and have a conversation. That's one of the benefits of of being in show business is, you know, you kind of learn these skills that are beyond your years and you're, you know, living and growing up in an adult world. There really aren't children around would you say donner was responsible for the fact that you branched into this multifaceted uh, fella in the entertainment is industry i mean folks stanley is a writer producer actor director mentor gifted artist and the list goes on i probably would have needed to take another breath but i got it all out in one breath and again, you you really got into the nuts and bolts of it, kind of like a kind of a Ron Howard esque yeah, type kind of story. Like Ron did. Uh, yeah, I think Ron pushed a little harder. Where I was still divided on you know what I was trying to do, uh, but yeah, it, uh, I guess Richard had you know some impact. I ended up working with him again. I think it was around 1974. I did a. Uh, TV movie for Universal called Lucas Tanner that starred David Hartman 
And um, anyway, I did the movie, but then they decided it was going to become a series, wanted me to sign a seven-year contract. And I was like, I just got out of a, like a 12-year contract. I don't, I don't know. I think I just, you know, want to see what else is out there. So I declined, which was probably, you know, looking at it now and knowing what I know now, should have said yes. Mm. You just say yes to everything that's being <laughs> offered because you can't say no to things that aren't being offered. And, uh, you know, that, that's just my, uh, when I speak to actors now, uh, yes. you know, that would be the advice that I, I would give them. And, you know, you learn so many things, but, and, you know, I was able to go back to Dick when I was, you know, I first starting off as a director and, you know, and him giving me guidance, on, you know, directorial things and editing things. And again, a guy that I, you know, tried to model myself somewhat after I, I just, you know, liked the way he conducted himself in the business. And sure. we remained friends back to later with all the things that I did learn. I thought, well, what can I use? You know, I want to do something with all this stuff I've learned. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction with that, uh, there was this thing that I saw happening to actors that still happens to actors because they're not completely trained when they come to the business. I mean, they're trained in the art and craft of acting. And doesn't matter whether you go to, you know, some mom pop acting school or whether somebody has got a little bit of experience or the actor studio or, you know, Beverly Hills Playhouse or Actors and Directors Lab or the actor studio in New York. Yeah, you learn how you learn all the skills you need to learn so that when you're on stage or in front of a camera, you're pretty competent. And of course, you know, acting is a learning process the whole time you're in it and you're always discovering new things. But there's this other component that I realized wasn't being taught at all. Um, and it really leaves competent people in the acting field completely at a detriment uh, to how to manage or launch a career or knowing what the business side of their acting career is. They know nothing, you know, and it's not taught. So I decided to do something about that. I guess it was about 10 years ago and created this program called The Actor's Journey. Yes. And I decided, you know, I wanted to do a program for actors just completely dedicated to the business side of being an actor, meaning the non-performance skills or the things that you do when you're not working to get a job. So you will be working. Right. Um, and great, great people that you had involved in that, too. It was yeah. Just yeah. So that's what I had to set out and called all my friends, all my peers uh, that I'd work with, told them what I was doing. And they all wanted to be a part of it. Well, almost all of them, uh, some didn't but you know they were either working or doing things and just weren't available when we were shooting it but we got over 100 people uh you know to show up and teach this program and it's a 10 hour long program it covers about 60 topics that are just related to the business side of the business not the act acting right. side right uh, and uh you know it's a about 45, 50 of those people are, you know, that well, all of them have been in the industry 20, 30 years. So they're bringing a lot of experience behind what advice and examples that they're using or advocating, you know, to, to move your career along. But 40 or 50, of the, 45 or 50 of those people had either won or been nominated for Academy Emmy Golden Globe Awards. So, you know, they were people at the top of their professions, not like learning it in, in, from an acting teacher who, really never got immersed into the business, probably start off work for a while and then didn't make it and decided to teach acting because they had a degree. And uh, so they're capable of teaching the acting. What they're not capable of is the day-to-day -day routine actors need to be aware of yes. uh, to, to conduct a career, to launch a career, to pro make a career progress. You know, how do you grow a career and what are the things to avoid? What are the things to do? Um, and, so basically, all those things, uh, we, like I said, had about 65 topics that we cover in this 10-hour program. And it's the only program of that type that I know about. It's still not taught, or not taught very extensively in college. I think they finally have a few things, but it's the most obvious stuff, you know, like, okay, you know, you need to get a reel. You, you need to get a headshot. Right. You need, yeah, you need to, um, you know, get a resume together. You, know, you need to try and get into the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, you need to get an agent or a manager. But, you know, even those are not really taught 
there, there's all kinds of things, the order of things, and they don't teach people even that. You know, oh, a lot yeah. of people in, you know, Pit join the Screen too. Act. <laughs> right. They get an opportunity to do a union film and join the Screen Actors Guild. And, you know, then they tell me that and I go, well, that's great. But, you, you know, you just probably killed your career. And I go, Why? <laughs> Why? I got, I got in. I go, well, uh, you know, you've done one or two things. So for actors at, at your level, most of the work is going to be non-union. And guess what? Now that you're in the union, you can't do non-union. Right. Or if they catch you, you'll be thrown out never to be able to get back in again. Right. So you cut, cut your nose off to spite your face. You know, people find out because there's nobody there to tell you, don't do that yet. You're, you're just If you can do that film, great. Do it. Get the voucher where you can join, but don't activate it till you think you have enough stuff where you've got a really good reel on yourself. Yeah, uh, but you know, people think if they join the union, now they're an actor. Now the doors are going to open. <laughs> yeah, you know, and instead, what you've done is just uh, put a blockade in front of yourself. But uh, there's so many things like that in the entertainment industry yes. that if you do them in the wrong order, you know, it's sort of like, well, I hope you had a nice time in show business. You got in, and now you're back out, right. and now you're not new, so you don't even have that in your you know favor anymore. Yeah, yeah brutal it's brutal something i'm kind of proud of and i i i'd almost rather be remembered for that than even my two sons i mean my two sons was enjoyable to fans but in terms of helping my brother actors out there so they don't get slaughtered like most of the actors or most of the people who tried to become actors in the 50s 60s 70s 80s and you know made incredible mistakes and uh, you know had very short careers right so originally you had this available in a dvd format if i'm not mistaken right and yeah yeah yeah, it was originally in DVD, and we did pretty well with it. Unfortunately, I got busy again, and I couldn't run the company at the time. In the interim, everything has gone to uh, streaming. So right. we're in the process. I'm hoping by the end of the year, uh, our website's back up again, and now it'll be available as streaming media, which is a lot easier you know, than carrying around a set of eight <laughs> DVDs, yeah. a DVD player. Yeah. You, know, you, you, meet, you can just go there, buy whatever you want of it. I mean, buy the whole thing, or like I said, it was divided into eight, uh, eight DVDs, covered the entire uh, topic, 10 hours on eight DVDs. Or you can, you know, watch just the segments that you're interested in and, you know, watch them all or watch, you know, some of them, whatever you want to do. So it's a lot inexpensive, a lot more inexpensive to, to do the program because when we had it, the DVDs were, you know, you had to buy the whole thing. So it was, I think it was 240 bucks, something like that, which, you know, uh, was about $30, I guess, a DVD. But uh, what's $240 when you just... Probably spent five thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars getting trained as an actor, and now don't know what to do with yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> you know. So uh, anyway, we you know tried to keep it inexpensive, but you know obviously there were people put up money to get it so we could get it done too. And you know you have investors, and uh, you know they have to be paid back and all that. So that was a concern. But you know I think even now doing the streaming media, it'll be uh, I said even a lot cheaper and a lot easier to watch because you could just be anywhere as long as you have a you know an iphone or an android or something you can just click on it and watch it on right. demand really so yeah i'm anxious to get that up and get out and start promoting it again and uh get get the word out that this thing exists and yeah. you know the material is eternal <laughs> you know how you get involved in the industry and the mistakes that actors make they're still making them that's that's the horrible part but uh see what we can do about that that's wonderful that's wonderful and of course i'll leave links to uh well i'll I'll push whatever you got (laughs) because again that is just that is so valid it is needed so much because again it's a lot of people go into the business i was in the music business for a long time and that was the same deal you'd sign oh i got signed well what did you get signed i got signed to a record company oh yeah what kind of record company was that (laughs) Don't worry about it. It's one of the big ones. Oh, okay. It's probably a sucker deal. And oh, yeah. I know about sucker deals. Oh uh, yeah. What does that mean? You know? Yeah. Well, it's the same thing here. I mean, there's a lot of things that go on for actors, especially at the beginning of your career, that sound like they're golden opportunities. Exactly. Money making 
opportunities really for these organizations that promise you the moon and deliver nothing. <laughs> they you know? suddenly become a bank. <laughs> right. But by the time you figure it out, you know, you're out five or ten thousand dollars. That's that's the that's the deal. Just imagine. Imagine how much talent has been left on the shelves in both the acting and music industries because of this stuff that you have addressed here. So I'm sure you've You've done a lot of good with this. I'm sure. Of it. Yeah, you know, even if it's just to stop somebody from spending money on right. something that's really not going to do them any good in terms of the industry, you know, perpetuate a career or launch a career. But you know, the people that do it, you have to realize they're experts of what they do too. And boy, yeah. you know, it, it's it's like all good cons. It's got a good patter that they give you, and you know, good promises and all this, but. You know, un unfortunately, there's history to show that these things really don't work out for for anybody, really, except for the company. And then, you know, finally, when they get sued too much, they go out of business and then come back in, a, in another city with another name and looking for new kids and new, especially for parents who want to involve their children. And that's another whole area. But, uh, you know, the adult actors have it bad enough, too. Uh, you know, you just... You need information. And right. the thing is, it, you know, to learn by trial and error, it's just, it's too time consuming in this industry because you, your experiences come so slowly and there's really nothing to put it in perspective because you really have nobody there guiding you in the beginning. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you have all this information and it's in your head, like right before you start, you'll know what you're doing you know, at least 99% of it. So you can make some kind of educated uh, guess or decision uh, about whether to do things or what this meant or how to, how to go about this or that. Right. So, yeah, that we try to catch people right when they're hopefully coming right out of acting school and are ready to hit the ground uh, running and you know, just for 10 hours before you hit the road, watch this <laughs> and you're, you're you can you can shave about five years off the beginning of uh, you know the learning process, uh, and it's just unfair that actors, in my estimation, it's the same thing no matter who you are, where you come from, what acting school. You got to learn the same stuff, so it's forcing actors. What I always tell them is to recreate the same wheel. <laughs> you know, where somebody could just say, "Here's the wheel," right, right. You don't have to do that anymore. Yep. Uh, if you want to, go ahead. It's a slow, torturous route. Uh, and, you know, you may or may not make it because you can make some devastating mistakes where people don't want to see you again. Right. So you're never going to be. Yeah, it's a small industry, especially when it comes down to the casting part of it. And if you make some critical mistakes in the beginning, you know, those casting people know each other. And just go, don't don't see that guy. He, you know, this is what he did. Oh, my yes. God. Yeah, I don't. You know, so you're out. Right. You don't want that to happen, not after you spend all that, you know, whatever, two, four, five years learning how to act, and right. now you don't get to use it, you know, or use it the way you want to. So, well, anyway, yeah. Again, I commend you. This is a, this is a very noble, noble cause. Um, you have another thing, First Team Productions. Now, I see you have a stake in everything. <laughs> you have so many different facets to what you work on, Stanley. It's extremely impressive. I know First Team is a production company. Can you tell us just a brief uh, tidbit about that and what's going on? Yeah. Well, that came out of, I guess, when I was about 16, 17, I got interested on the other side of the camera. And what better place to learn about it than while you're working and you have all these old guys who are working <laughs> on my three sons that, you know, I thought of as, you know, just these old geezers working on our show, you know, the DP, the lighting guy, the gaffers, the grips and all. But they were really, you know, they were young guys at one time too, and had worked at MGM, 20th Century Fox, Universal, uh, and learned their craft and learned it really well. And by the time I came along and was interested in that, I, I just wanted to learn everything I could about everything. And, uh, you know, wanted to have a production company. So, uh, you know, I would sit down and have discussions with directors that I knew, uh, you know, with the, uh, the DP and some of these guys, you know, yeah, they're kind of in the sunset of their careers, but a couple of them had won Academy Awards, you mm -hmm. know, 
for, for as being directors of photography. So they were the guys to talk to and, and learn about cameras and lenses and the film emulsions when we did shoot and film and you kind of had to know that stuff and lab procedure and all these different things and lighting, like why they put that light there, why are you using this kind of light instead of that kind of, you know, I got to ask everything. And right. the same thing in the editing realm, I'd go up and sit with the editors and they were really, you know, genuinely cool guys who were happy to impart all this knowledge to me and uh you know where, where else could you get it i mean that was like a gift yeah uh the guy that was that i had a camera class uh one of the colleges that i went to well he was also the head of the camera department at cbf a guy named peter gibbons that i knew so you know i saw these guys working you know on the lot but they were also educators and would teach classes and classes at the colleges so um, yeah, it was a really unique place to be. So I ended up forming a production company when, when I was 18 with a partner. And, yeah, we just started shooting things, uh, whatever we could get, industrials, PSAs, uh, music videos, um, educational films, you name it. And, you know, worked up and shot a lot of, you know, a lot of film in those days. And everything was edited on movieolas and chem tables and finally uh, linear editors and then finally computerized non-linear editors mm -hmm. and the same thing with the cameras going from you know 35 millimeter a lot of times you shoot 16 uh you know, learning the film stocks and when you need to use it and how the S asa ratings you know would do different things allow you to shoot at night or not at night you had slow film stock so yeah i learned as much as i could and uh you know you just learn by doing uh, and then eventually I, I, you know, went on my own. I had first team productions and been involved in everything from producing TV pilots, uh, feature films, uh, did a Cinerama film back in 2012, but I was involved with another guy and, uh, he, he came to me and said, Hey, I would like to be involved in shooting a, a Cinerama film. I think we can restore one of the old Cinerama cameras and, and do a thing. So I was like, wow, that sounds cool. So I got involved in that. So yeah, over the years, <laughs> I've shot in every medium. I know that from eight millimeter, to super eight, the 16, super 16, 35 millimeter, uh, 70 millimeter Cinerama, three strip Cinerama every form of digital, uh, you know, so I rest yeah, my case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, you learn a lot by doing it. And, you know, some people want to know that part and other people don't even people that have, you know, become directors such as myself, you know, they just want to direct actors. But I, I just was always a guy that was interested in the technical side and the technical side of editing so that you're proficient as an editor and, you know, really don't need an operator, but, right. uh, you know, I've worked in, with uh, God Media 100, uh, Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere. Yay. One of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feature heavy, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's, I think of Robert Rodriguez and his, his quote, which was, when you bridge the gap between technology and creativity, the world is yours. <laughs> yeah yeah so you know and as a producer it helps too because you know when other people don't know their job so you have to keep an eye on them you know especially sound sound guys I and mean, i've done sound and you know i can watch somebody from a distance and look and go that boom guy does not have that mic <laughs> pointed where it needs to be and i remember i'd walk over and i'd push the tip of the boom and go it needs to be here not over here because you're off axis over there and then I would demonstrate to him what that meant, you know, have the actor say a line while it was off axis and then push the mic over where it was supposed to be. And all of a sudden you have, you know, the full sound and they go, oh, oh yeah, wow. Like, yeah, well, that, that's what it needs to be. So yeah. make, sure you, make sure you're awake. There you go. Again drives home the point that you're just you're kind of the jack of all trades i don't even get me started on your artwork stanley um well, that's nice of you sometimes i feel more like the jackass of all trades but whatever but it's brilliant i mean the color usually i don't know if i'm staring at a photograph or painting or both or it's just astonishingly good artwork and again Art, that's artwork 
Yeah, it came, my training came out of being on a soundstage, you know, from the time I was a kid. And there really wasn't anything you could do that made very little noise. So I learned how to paint, you know, right. from drawing, charcoal, pastel to, you know, watercolor, acrylic, oil painting and all that and kind of mastered a lot of those techniques. And then, yeah, started painting and, you know, again, as an actor, even as a, a producer, you know, not a hundred percent of your time is filled up doing all that. And sometimes you just want to get the hell away from it. Yeah. So I took up painting, did a lot of paintings. In fact, that's what I was saying. I never, I had, I used to do stained glass too. That's kind of, you know, how more people know me as an artist when I lived in Laurel Canyon. Yeah. When I wasn't working, I, I had a little impromptu stand that I would put out by the side of the road. Uh, and it had my stained glass work on it, and nobody knew who I was. It was just some crazy <laughs> Laurel Canyon artist who uh, did stained glass, and people pulled my art and go, "Wow, that's cool!" And they would buy it and take take care, you know, take it away. And I, but over the course of time, I, you know, some of the people that were pulling my art even surprised me, and I was kind of unrecognizable. It was probably about 1980, 81 when I first started doing that intermittently between projects or between going off to do a play or doing something with my company. Um, yeah, they pull in and I had a beard, so they didn't recognize me, but you know, I met like Hugh Hefner, bought one, <laughs> Sher Sherman Hemsley, Michael Jackson, Stephen Stills. I mean, there's a whole list of, you know, pretty big celebrities just kind of pulling in my yard and going, wow, that's cool. Or could you do this? You know, and then I do a custom one for them. So <laughs> anyway, I did that, but I, you know, I'd always done the paintings. I just never, you know, brought the paintings out. And a lot of them I just gave away, you know, it was like I did them for my friends and, but I always took pictures of them. So I would have high resolution right. uh, images to work from if I ever wanted to syndicate them. And that's kind of what I, I decided to do this year. About two months ago, I, Finally got my website up. Uh, I call it Stanley Livingston Art dot com. Uh, that's my online gallery, and put up about sixty of the paintings, and people order them, and I end up getting you know high end prints or lithography done. So they're um, yeah doing pretty pretty well at it. And it, it, not just one thing. I'm, I'm kind of not one of those artists that go oh that's a Yamagata or oh that's Monet, you know, and they just have a look. I sort of whatever interests me i paint it you know it could be an abstract could be a geometric could be just flowers or a house or whatever you know whatever i felt like painting i've even painted an old jalopy once it was this truck but it was looked like it'd been out in the desert and looked all that. rusted out but it was yeah just so interesting to yeah, me. I, go, I gotta i gotta i gotta paint that so yeah. now this um, this stuff is top notch folks um Again, it must have been so gratifying, too, with people buying it, not knowing who you were. Yeah. You know, it was really funny sometimes because people would buy it and, you know, cart it off in their car. Or occasionally, I'd have a guy on a motorcycle pull up and I'd go, oh, God, I'm wasting my time out here talking to this guy. How's he going to take it? And so, anyway, he would buy something, pay me cash, and then he says, I'll be back uh, in a couple of days with my car. You know, and I said, like, okay. There was one painting some guy did that with. And the guy never came back. I don't oh. know if he forgot about it or got killed in a <laughs> motorcycle crash. But for like 10 years while I was doing it off and on, I had this guy's painting at the back of my garage. And then it, the funny part was that forgot about it. And, it, you know, I stopped doing the stained glass probably about 1990. It was from about 1980 to 1990 when it, I had this little flurry of activity out there. And so for another... Wow, well, 90, 2000, about another 25 years, this stained glass piece was at the back of my garage. And I was like, geez, I wonder if one of them, I, I guess it's okay to, you know, give this thing away or throw it away or whatever. This guy's not coming back. It's been 30 years. Uh oh. But, yeah, I know. <laughs> and the so next I, day. <laughs> right, right. And then the next day, no, the guy never came and I moved. So, yeah, better yeah, yet. He's out. Right. So I was paid for, for doing a stained glass that nobody ever came for. I think I donated it to a charity or something. They probably resold it. So. That's better because if you'd have sold it twice, it would have just been wrong. You know that. Yeah, that, that would have been a curse. Karma would so. not have been working for you. In that case. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, I, I, probably over that 10 years, I probably did, wow, 
I would imagine at least 500, maybe a thousand pieces of stained glass art. I was pretty busy. And it's beautiful. This is stanleylivingstonart.com that they can take a look at this stuff. Yeah, yeah, they can go there and look. Like I said, it's pretty, it's pretty much my paintings that are up there. Stained glass is impossible to sell and mail or, you know, just uh, price, I guess you would say, prohibitive in, in the shipping part of it now. So, I, you know, I basically got out of that and I don't have a studio to do that. But, you know, and, and the paintings that I have up, though, yeah, they, like I said, they, they're definitely a professional level and, for people that are, you know, want to own celebrity art, it's kind of cool. Or people that just appreciate art for art's sake, which is and, a lot of people. Right. And, of course, great gift idea, folks. Great gift idea. So it would be an autographed picture. Well, on my personal website, just stanleylivingston.com, I just redid that, too. I finally got my uh, – I put it up about two year 2000 or 1999. I never – updated it and so i had some time off because uh we had some things going on around the house where we couldn't go anywhere or do anything plus the COVID. And, you know i really should redo this this website bring it up to date put it on a new platform and do it the way i originally wanted to do it which is a little bit different than what i had uh so yeah as of about two months ago i got that up and there's a lot of besides, you know, information about me because that that was the other thing because people, you know, are like, oh, do you can you get a resume or what? What are the things you've done? Especially when I do interviews, I just refer them to that because it's got everything you could possibly want to know about me. And uh, there's also a section there with photographs, so I kind of divided that into two things: one with everything kind of relating to my two sons or the cast of my three sons and then the other being the movies and TV shows I was in and all the photographs, unlike before that you can buy them and get them autographed by me and uh, pick out the one you want, click the button right below it. And you know, I it, it put in your credit card or PayPal information and uh, I receive it and the photograph goes off in the mail you know, a day or two later and, that's how I've been doing that one. Uh, same thing really with the artwork. You know, you kind of get there. There's like five galleries. You click on a gallery and each gallery has got about 10, 15 paintings. You click on the one you like. It's got a bigger version of it so you can look at it. And there's a detailed shot. And then if you scroll down the page, uh, there's, you know, four four of the same thing, but they're different sizes. You know, like a 16 by 20, uh, uh, 20 by 30, 24 by 36, and 30 by 40. And you just pick the one you want and click the button below it, and that's how you order it. And it takes about two weeks to get that, though, because they are hand-printed. And then they have to come to me to proof it, and that's when I sign and number it, and it gets assigned a serial number. And then when they ship it out, it's shipped out with a certificate of authenticity. And then you get it, and you, however you want to frame it or mat it, that's up to you, because that's... I only do the artwork and you right. can frame it however you want. Dress it up how you like, folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this has just been amazing. And I, I thank you so much for your time, Stanley. It's yeah. uh, It's been so neat getting to know you better. And I appreciate that. Hearing your uh, your wonderful experiences and, and, and to know that you're not jealous that I called your brother my favorite because in actuality you are, but... <laughs> I say that to you all gotta, the brothers. You got to say what you got to say, man. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, it's kind of like being a politician these days. Yes, you got to exactly. please everybody, even if you don't mean it, you know, but that, that's isn't, how you do it. <laughs> isn't that true? Oh, my gosh. I, I didn't well, I really want to feel like that, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just an enthusiast. I'm not a politician. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, this country, uh, at least half of it got P.T. barnum I call it. Yeah. <laughs> they heard they heard what they wanted to hear. Exactly. And not right. realizing, it was like, well, how could that guy be for everything? How could he, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All the right answers. <laughs> what? Like, hello. That's right. right. Yeah, I'm for that, and I'm for that, and I'm for that. Like, <laughs> what a world we live in. That's true. Well, Thank you for keeping the nostalgic aspect of it alive and well for all of us, because right now, yeah. more than ever, we really do appreciate that. And so, yeah, oh, it's a great thing that can go on and on. God bless me TV for, you know, yeah. uh, keeping it on the air and it being on, I think at 630 in the morning, which is a little early, but, uh, you know, there's people get up and 
watch it. I, you know, it's like, totally amazing. I think there's another channel called Legends that runs it too. Right. They kind of do weekend marathons where we'll start at six o'clock on Friday and go to like midnight on Sunday or something like that. So it's, yeah, it's kind of cool. And then there's actually uh, film chains out there that, you know, with local stations that still have prints that they run, you know, locally. So it's all over the place. So yeah. as long as it keeps going, you know, I, they've extended my 15 minutes of fame by about 61 years or something. <laughs> it's like, holy moly. Well, Never would have expected that. Yeah. We all know, know it was it, far more than 15 minutes. So with that said, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's about like, right. I think it equals out just about right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I keep thinking maybe somebody doesn't realize it's still on. I used to joke about that when it was on the air, we were getting to season eight, nine, ten, and twelve. I go, you know, I... I have this feeling it's CBS. They just forgot they put it on and don't realize it's still playing. <laughs> you know, it's just, someday somebody's going to figure out it's still on and go, oh my God, we left this thing on four years too long. <laughs> <laughs> and no one ever shut it off. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, nobody shut it off. It's still going out to homes and people are watching some show that shouldn't be on, but it's on. And, and now it's like, you know, 62, going on 63 years later and, it's still out there. Uh, it's crazy. And it really is kind of crazy, but I'm certainly thrilled that it's our show doing that along with, you know, leave it to beaver. It looks like Hap- not happy days. What was the original one? Uh, with Andy Griffith, yeah. the Andy Griffith show. That's another one that, you know, people just dearly love or yeah. green acres, you know, never get tired of it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You never get tired of it. It's great. Well, thank you again, Pat. appreciate you having me on and uh, we'll do it again at some point. I hope so, sir. All right, yeah. Maybe after I get the journey back up, I'll, I'll talk to you again. We can, I can tell you some stories on that that you you wouldn't believe. <laughs> that's oh. that's the fun part of the actor's journey, and that's the reason I did it. I mean, I could have done it myself, and I am the host. That kind of I just you know lead in the segments for a minute here, a minute there. But it's the stories that are in there, and then stories behind the stories. That's the reason I invited the people uh, that I wanted to exemplify certain things that go on in the industry. Because not only do they get the point across, they're very, very funny, and the way these sure. people tell them, it just it's hysterical. So you know, it's kind of an entertaining way to learn these principles or about things that normally you wouldn't think about if you were an actor, but it, it kind of gets you thinking. And then when you've seen it's actually happened to people who are big stars or, you know, had long careers, you go, wow, you know, I, I, I had no idea that's the kind of things that can happen to people that you have to surmount, but there's ways to surmount it. And right. So right. that was the idea behind it. Anyway, well, we'll talk again. Thank you, Stanley. You have a great day. So there you have it. Another retro TV trivia episode in the books. Remember to check out StanleyLivingston.com to learn more about his course, The Actor's Journey. And don't forget to have a look at his incredible artwork that he has for sale. Talk about some great gift ideas. Thanks for listening to this podcast. And please take the time to like, subscribe, and give me a positive rating and review. Or simply spread the word. You can also follow me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Golden Rage of TV and on Twitter at Golden Rage of TV One. Until next time, I'm your host, Pat McCormack, and thanks for listening to Retro TV Trivia. Retro TV Trivia.